Ellen and James White considered themselves pilgrims on this earth, willing to move from place to place as the varied needs of the Advent movement directed. The Whites lived in many locations in the United States, and after James' death in 1881, Ellen also lived in Europe for two years from 1885 to 1887, and Australia for nine years from 1891 to 1900. A house Ellen White had expected to spend the rest of her life in was Sunnyside, as she named it, where she lived from 1895 to 1900 in Cornbong, Australia. During the Sunnyside years, White finished The Desire of Ages, published in 1898, completed two companion books, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings in 1896 and Christ's Object Lessons in 1900, and also wrote volume six of Testimonies for the Church and commenced the book Education. When Ellen White returned to the United States in 1900, Sunnyside was sold. The Adventist Church repurchased Sunnyside in 1958 and later restored it to serve as a museum. Today, more than 2,000 visitors from around the world visit Sunnyside each year. To learn more about other important places for Adventist history, visit the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists, ESDA, at encyclopedia.adventist.org and check out also over 4,000 stories, thousands of photographs, and hundreds of videos on Adventist history. Encyclopedia.adventist.org. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you all to this uh, Ellen G. White Symposium. And let me introduce to you Ian Sweeney, Pastor Ian Sweeney. He is the chair of the board of uh, Ellen G. White Research Center, and he is also the field secretary of the Trans-European Division, unlike what your program says. I'd like to welcome everyone here. I. From I arrived on the campus, people were saying, you're the BUC president. I do realize it is election season. United Kingdom, the United States, etc. But trust me, European Parliament as well. But trust me, I am not running for president. However, you can support my candidacy at uh, <laughs> But it's really good that we have gathered from right across uh, our Europe, Trans-European Division territory, and we pray that this weekend will be a real blessing and our faith in God and in His Word and in the, those whom He uses through His Spirit would be strengthened. And so it really is a pleasure to be a ch the chair of the E.G. White Research Center Board here on the campus of Newbold. And as I had written in the introduction, this, I pray, is a first and last 50th anniversary. If there are any of us who will be alive in another 50 years, just raise your hands. Okay, clearly not keeping the health message. Uh, but I pray that the Lord Jesus will have come long before. But I pray that this weekend for you, for your church members, and for everyone here, will be a tremendous, a tremendous blessing. And so welcome, and may God bless us as we proceed through listening, praying, and, and asking questions over the presentations that will be presented through the course of this weekend. Thank you, Ian, and welcome to all our presenters. Welcome to Audrey Anderson, the General Vice President of the General Conference. You are coming back home. Audrey Anderson has been the chair of the board for 12 years of the LNG Wide Research Center. So welcome everybody to this uh, momentous occasion of celebrating 50th anniversary of LNG Wide Research Center. We are gathered here to celebrate half of a century of scholarly pursuit, exploration of ideas, enlightenment of soul that was inspired by the life and teachings of LNG White. For five decades, the research center 
on campus of Newbold College has been a beacon of knowledge, fostering understanding and appreciation for the profound contributions of this remarkable figure of religious thought, health, and social reform. As we reflect on the legacy of Ellen G. White, we are reminded of her enduring impact on millions of people around the globe. Her writings spanning a wide array of topics from spirituality to health reform continue to inspire and guide individuals on their respective journeys of faith and personal development as well as the church as an institution. I hope that throughout this symposium we will delve into the rich tapestry of Ellen G. White's writing, exploring not only the historical context, theological significance, but also the relevance for today's world. I remember when I came to Newbold as a lecturer in 1998, I was introduced to this idea of external examiners. And, uh, one of our external examiners was a Catholic professor at the University of Southampton, and he was reading the papers that student wrote for the Ellen G. White class. And uh, he was impressed, and he made good remarks about the class and what we do. But in the summary, he said, don't you think you are looking a little bit too much into the past? And we thought, that's a good thought to reflect on. Yes, our distinguished speakers with the, that will offer insights, perspectives, and scholarly discourse that will undoubtedly enrich our understanding of this influential figure in Adventism and help us to better appreciate her ministry and her teachings. So, as we commemorate this milestone anniversary, we will also acknowledge the dedication and passion of all those who have contributed to the work of LNG White Research Center over the years. The directors, the researchers, educators, and the supporters. Thanks to their untiring or tireless effort and unwavering commitment is that the legacy of Ellen White in this part of the world continues to shine brightly, illuminating our path forward. So, welcome and let us embark together on this journey of discovery together, honoring the past, embracing the present, and shaping the future as we celebrate 50th anniversary of LNG Wide Research Center in this symposium. And thank you for coming and being the part of this momentous occasion. Good evening. Let us start with an acknowledgement how great our God is. Let us stand, sing from our experience, from the bottom of our hearts, from the depths of our souls. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father.
Shall we remain standing as we come before the throne of grace in prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we come and we acknowledge your faithfulness. We are here to celebrate your goodness, the work of a woman that you called, who has guided and directed. We pray and commit ourselves this weekend. Open our hearts, open our minds. Help us to hear your voice speaking to each one of us. Accept our praise and our adoration and our gratitude that you are God who meets us where we are and lifts us up. We commit ourselves and our time together into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. There is a children's service and a service for young people in Salisbury Hall. And at this time, if there are any children or young people here, we would follow on. So Arne's at the back and Arne's waving his hands. If any children or young people, please follow him. Thank you so much. At this time, I'd like to call Dr. Burt up. Dr. Merlin Burt. Oh, you're there. Okay. Dr. Burt, we just sung this amazing song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, beautifully played as well. But over the weekend, we're going to be singing a song with 11 verses. 11 verses. I heard silence in the room. I'm not accustomed to singing um, songs, hymns, more than about three or four verses. I would like you to tell us a little about this song called Calvary and what it actually means in the context of this symposium. I have this mic, I think, that works. It's uh, really a song that goes back to our earlier history. The name that's remembered, associated most with it, is a man named Hiram Edson, who played an important role in the development of the sanctuary doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And for him, and for our early Adventists, Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross was the heart and center. He was the Savior who was now in the heavenly sanctuary. And he had a beautiful um, voice, a baritone voice, that people remembered him singing this song with great energy. There's something about this, these 11 verses, though. They cannot be sung like a drudge. They have to move right along. So I hope that's being planned here. You have to learn it first. But I think this song gets under your skin and into your heart. And uh, you'll be able to say, when you walk out of here, how can I forget thee? How can I forget my Lord? Because that's a part of the song. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. So now I'm going to invite Cart to come up and to teach us the song. So this evening we're going to sing the first verse of the song twice. It's quite short. We're going to learn it. And tomorrow and over the weekend, we will sing all 11 verses. I think if 
if you've ever been to uh, children's camperies, then you recognize the melody from Oh How I Love Jesus. Um, so I suspect that we can just start from the beginning and do it twice through with the gusto that we were encouraged to have. <laughs> do you think you can do it seated? Come on, my soul, to Calvary. Three speakers this evening who will present what they understand about the Bible and Ellen White and the role of a prophet. The first is Dr. Merlin Burt, who is the director of the Ellen White Estate and the field secretary for the General Conference of Seventh day Adventists. He previously served as the founding director of the Integrated Center for Adventist Research which includes the White Estate branch at Andrews University. He's been with the Ellen White Estate since 1993. From 2003 to 2020, he served as a professor of church history at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary. And previous to his academic and administrative appointments, Dr. Burt served for a number of years as a pastor in California and Ohio. He and his wife, Sarah, have two sons, a daughter, and six grandchildren. His major tome, if I can put it like that, is this book, Understanding Ellen White. Now, be assured, I'm not trying to sell a book to you on his behalf, but I'm simply trying to share with you the passion and enthusiasm that Mervyn has for the role of Ellen White and her contribution to the growth of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It is a major work, and he's put his life and his soul into it, and I want to recognize that. And he's also known by a colleague, Michael W. Campbell, as an Adventist archaeologist who has gone through the eastern seaboard of the United States, from New York up to Maine, searching for the story of where Ellen White lived. And, of course, to understand her ministry, you have to understand the world in which she lived in. And with great enthusiasm and, and excitement, I can imagine you going places, and I found something that contributes to the story. He is the author of this, this other book, Adventist Pioneer Places, and is in the process of writing a textbook on the, de on the development of Seventh-day Adventist theology. So the presentation he will share this evening is Young Ellen and the Love of God. Welcome, Dr. Burt. We look forward to what you have to share with us. I have this. I guess they can put up the slides that I will use. Young Ellen and the Love of God. It's a great privilege to be with you for this weekend and that we can consider the ministry of Ellen White and her work. You cannot understand Adventist experience and Ellen White unless you understand how passionate they were about Jesus. 
William Miller himself, if we had time, who started the Millerite movement, was passionate about Jesus. And two key texts that connect to Ellen White's experience are 1 John 1, 9. We know these texts, by the way, and I hope you cherish them as much as Ellen White did and as much as our pioneers did. If we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then maybe the text, almost above all others, that describes Ellen White's experience is 1 John 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us or given to us, that we should be called what? The children, the sons and daughters of God. First generation connected to Christ. I've titled this and the presentation I'm making, Young Ellen and the Love of God, because what we don't always realize is that Ellen White, before she had her first vision in December of 1844, had a very thorough and challenging conversion experience that prepared her for what would come later in her life. I we have this picture. This is the earliest picture we have of James and Ellen White. It's taken around 1857. We don't have a picture of her as a young girl. I mean, she's still relatively young here in her 30s. But uh, we don't have a picture of her very young. Um, I mentioned Ellen White and William Miller. There is a correspondence in their passion about Jesus, and it goes back to their conversion experiences. I think it's important we know the story of those who have had a powerful impact on the church and on the world. I don't want to take long on this. I'll mention it more tomorrow morning in the sermon, but this is a picture of William Miller's Bible with some of the, his tools, his magnifying glass, his pen, and his watch. But the Bible is the one that he preached from during the late 1830s. And he used it so much that it had wear patterns on it. I think you can see on the screen the yellowing on the sides and in the middle where he held the Bible. And you would expect that type of wear in the books of Daniel and Revelation, and in fact you do in some other prophetic portions. But the area that has the most wear in this Bible of William Miller, the most consistent long wear is the Gospels. So William Miller used the Gospels to preach, or excuse me, let me restate this correctly. He used the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation to teach and present the Gospel. And Ellen White's entire prophetic ministry was also focused on Jesus and the Gospel. Uh, this is a first broadside of Ellen White that she published or what she didn't publish, but uh, Heman Gurney did, in April 6, 1846. And it has her first three major visions. And when you read those and look at that particular uh, broadside, which is the content is now in the book Early Writings, you find that it has... Well, I want to show you here. I went too far. There it is. Her first vision, which is recorded there, we sometimes call the midnight cry vision. It's also called the Christ of the narrow way vision and has God's people on a path going to New Jerusalem. But they're following Jesus. And as long as they keep their eyes fixed on Jesus, they're safe. People don't realize that her first vision is centered on Jesus. Her second major vision, we sometimes call the bridegroom vision, which she had in February. These are the major content visions. She had some other personal, smaller visions. And this vision in February 1844, it was 45, it was Jesus who was leading his people to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Again, they're following Jesus. And her third major vision is the new earth vision, which hopefully will come up. There it is. It's just not visible back here which she had in May of 1845, and it's Jesus who gives her a tour of the new earth. Now, that's one vision I would have loved to have had. Wouldn't you like to have in vision a tour of the future new earth that we will inhabit forever and ever? She came back, came out of that vision, and she said, 
dark, it's so dark. Oh, that I had wings like a dove, that I could fly away and be at rest. I have seen a better land. I've seen a better land. The Christ-centeredness of Ellen White's prophetic ministry actually began for her before her first vision. And that's what I want to take a few minutes to talk about. Ellen White's experience, starting at about the age of nine, uh, went through a very traumatic and protracted period of several years, about seven years. She first had a deathbed conversion around 1836. In 1841, she came to understand justification by faith. And during 1842, 43, after her baptism, she grappled with sanctification in light of the second coming of Jesus and assurance in light of this. Now, you wouldn't think that a young girl who, or young person, uh, boy or girl, would be so engaged at this deep of a level, but this was the case of her experience. At about nine, she had that... Um, accident where a rock was thrown, broke her nose, knocked her out, badly wounded her. The doctors removed the bone in her nose, uh, part of the cartilage. She was in a delirium for several weeks, and when she came out of this, her life was changed. She overheard her parents talking to the neighbors about her burial robe, and as a young girl, she came to the conclusion that she was going to die, just as a preteen, nine years old. And she says that she simply gave her heart to Jesus and found peace. We know she found peace because there was an aurora borealis, a dramatic northern lights display. Um, a few months after she probably had her accident there in 1837, beginning of 37, and she clapped her hands for joy because she thought Jesus would be coming. So she had this simple conversion experience. Her parents were Methodist. And she had read many books about uh, children who had had injuries or illness and had looked to the Lord and been forgiven and died with a glow on their brow. And for her, this kind of was her experience, she thought. And she was joyful in the Lord, but she didn't die. And now what do you do? Well, she tried to recover. She went back to school. Her greatest desire was to get a good education. She, in fact, actually had was very good at school. She described that before her accident, she had finished the lower level and had moved up to the, the place where the older kids would help the younger kids learn to read, write, do arithmetic, and so forth. So she was a good student, but every time she went back to school, she became dizzy, she became disoriented, her injury was affecting her. She tried three years, had to stop school. Now, she began to be restless in God's hands. She talks about it a little bit. I should probably show you a few pictures. This is a picture of Robert Harmon, Ellen White's father. We don't have a picture of her mother. And this is an end-of-life picture of Robert Harmon, but at least we have one. And this is the Chestnut Street Methodist Church where she was a member and the Brackett Street School where she went to school after her accident. There was another building there that burned or that was destroyed, that she went to school before her accident. But that is still standing today. It's the only thing connected to Elvin White almost that's still standing there in Portland, Maine. <clears throat> but she wrestled with a couple of things in that period when she knew she wasn't, she wasn't dying, and now how was she going to live her life with the Lord? One of them, her, her confusions and her problems, was the nature of Christian experience. Uh, the sinful human nature, she didn't understand that. She had, as I said, read these biographies that showed young people who, you know, had these struggles with their health and so forth, and they just trusted in the Lord, and no matter what troubles came at them, they were trusting and joyful, and so she thought that was the Christian experience. She didn't understand about struggle, and so she also didn't really understand about forgiveness, because unless we understand that we're sinners and we're helpless. We can't understand that we have a, a Savior who is a tender redeemer of those who are sinners. Aren't you glad for that? Our children need to understand this. The other thing that she struggled with was this view that the Methodist had of an eternally burning hell. She couldn't imagine how God could be loving and burn someone in hell, 
eternally. And so these things combined were swirling in her experience, and it led her to a point of deep depression and discouragement about her experience that went on for a couple of years. It was finally at a camp meeting, a Methodist camp meeting in 1841 in Buxton, Maine, that she found the courage to go forward to the altar and pray. She had heard a sermon from the minister who had preached on Queen Esther and the king, and how in fear she went before the king, knowing that if he didn't extend, this, extend the scepter, she could be, would be killed. And yet he extended the scepter, and the minister said, you're like Esther, and God is like the king. And she related to that, because that's how she was feeling about God. And he said to her and to the others there, go to the king, go to God. You may find that he will extend the scepter of mercy to you. And so that led her forward. So she read this text, which I want to, or that she makes this statement about her experience, if we could bring this back up on the screen. Um, I felt, and this is only part of it, I don't have time to read all of this, it's a very brief telling of her story. I felt my needy, helpless condition as never before, but suddenly as I prayed, she says, my burden left me. And my heart was light. I felt that the Savior had blessed me. And what does she say there? Pardoned my sins. You see, she had come to realize her helplessness, her need, her sinfulness. And the Holy Spirit helped her there. And she gave her heart to Jesus. It was a wonderful day for her. She was taken in on probation soon after that in the Methodist Church. And they had a six-month probation period. The next spring of 1842, she was uh, voted to be baptized and went into the Pacific Ocean there, Casco Bay and the waves, and was baptized by immersion. And she says that as she came up out of the water, her peace flowed like a river. And she said, now, now I'll live that perfect life with Jesus because I'm a new creature. The old person has died in the watery grave. She still didn't really understand that we remain as dependent upon the forgiving and cleansing grace of Jesus at the end as we do at the beginning. Is that true? It's so true. <clears throat> Ellen White, I don't want to look at that quite yet. I'm going to leave it on this other one. Ellen White, she was still Ellen Harmon, began to struggle when she realized she still had some of the same failings that she had had before her baptism. Baptism is a marriage, not a graduation. It's the beginning, it's not the end. And she began to doubt her experience and went into an even deeper depression because now she had denied the Lord, she thought, and Jesus was soon to come. What could she do? And during this time, she had two personal dreams. These were not prophetic dreams. She doesn't consider them to be the beginning of her prophetic ministry, but they were used by God in her conversion experience and are very powerful. The first dream, she, it was a nightmare. It wasn't a good thing. She saw this platform with a central pillar, and tied to the pillar was a lamb, a bleeding, mangled lamb, representing Jesus, of course, right? People would step up onto the platform, go forward to the lamb, confess their sins, and look happy. She stepped onto the platform, but she held back from going forward because she was unworthy. She wasn't, she had, she had failed the Lord. How could she go forward there? And as she was holding back, a bright light and a trumpet blast was heard, and all the happy people disappeared, and she was left standing there. She woke up from this dream. And she describes in her own, own words, she said, I felt that my doom was fixed, that the Spirit of the Lord had departed never to return. And in this extremely dejected and broken state of mind and attitude, she had a second dream. You know, it's when we're utterly helpless that we can have true faith. If we think we can do 50%, if we can do 40%, if we can do 20%, then Jesus can make up the rest and somehow it'll be okay. But when we have no resources, that's when we're ready.
for faith because faith is entirely depending upon Jesus alone to save us. So she had a second dream. And in this dream, she was taken by a beautiful being up into a room, and there was Jesus. Can you imagine having a dream with Jesus in the room? And this is what she said. There was no mistaking that beautiful countenance, that expression of benevolence and majesty could belong to no other. As his gaze rested upon me, I knew at once that he was acquainted with every circumstance of my life and all my inner thoughts and feelings. Can you imagine having someone look at you who really knows every single thing about you, the most intimate, the things no one else knows? You're naked to the soul. That's what it was. She says, I tried to shield myself from his gaze, feeling unable to endure his searching eyes, but he drew near to me with a smile and laying his hand on my head said, fear not. Now, what's wrong with this picture? Nothing. But for her, it's all upside down. How can he smile at her if he knows her through and through? How can he walk to her and put his hand on her and say, fear not. How can he do that? She's too great a sinner. Even after she's been forgiven. But he said, fear not. She says, the sound of his sweet voice thrilled my heart with happiness it had never before experienced. I was too joyful to utter a word. But overcome with emotion, sank prostrate at his feet. This is all before her first vision. Well, not long after this, or actually, um, as soon as this has happened, she found courage to talk to her mother about her struggles. And he sent her to talk to Levi Stockman, a Methodist minister, a very beloved and respected minister who was able to help her. And he helped her to understand the love of God. During this time, she also had come to understand that hell was a terminal event, not an eternal event. It was forever in the sense of its result, not in its operation. And she was able to accept what Elder Stockman said. She went to her uncle's house and prayed there in public for the first time. And after those experiences, she realized that God loved her. And she wrote these words in a manuscript, the Life Sketches manuscript. Through her interview with Levi Stockman and her prayer there in her uncle's home, she says, my views of the Father, capital F, were changed. I now looked upon him as a kind and tender parent rather than a stern tyrant compelling men to blind obedience. My heart went out toward him in deep and fervent love. A father, not a tyrant. This is her paradigm that she operates under for the rest of her life. And don't let anyone else tell you anything different. I've looked at it carefully. Yes, she emphasizes holiness. But she refers to the matchless charms of Christ, which is her words, her early words for righteousness by faith. You have to understand her. Her books are Christ-centered, many of all of them, and some are directly focused that way. You can see these. Maybe you're familiar with them. I hope you'll read them. I hope you have read them. Very powerfully helpful. A favorite statement of mine that I heard as a boy when Kenneth Wood, who was um, editor of the Review and Herald and who was also uh, chair of the White Estate Board. And by the way, Andre Anderson went from being the chair of the Research Center Board to the White Estate asking her, to be chair of the White Estate Board for the General Conference. So, Audrey, we're so glad to have you as the chair. But Kenneth Wood, I heard him read this when I was a young boy in camp meeting. And it, it's something that stuck with me about Ellen White. And I wish everyone would have this one in their mind when they think of Ellen White. She wrote, all the paternal love, this is fatherly love, our heavenly father, the right type of fatherly love. All the paternal love which has come down from generation to generation through the channel of human hearts, all the springs of tenderness which have opened in the souls of men are but a tiny rill. A rill is a small stream that dries up when the sun comes out. 
So it's just a little bit. So all of the human fatherly love is like a little stream that dries up in the sun. And she says here, uh, to the boundless ocean when compared with the infinite, exhaustless love of God. Tongue cannot utter it. Pen cannot portray it. You may meditate upon it every day of your life. You may search the scriptures diligently in order to understand it. You may summon every power and capability that God has given you in the endeavor to comprehend the love and compassion of the Heavenly Father. She goes on, and yet there is an infinity beyond. You may study that love for ages, yet you will never fully comprehend the length, the breadth, the depth and the height of the love of God in giving his son to die for the Lord. Eternity it die for us. Eternity itself can never fully reveal it. Yet as we study what? What? The Bible and meditate upon the life of Christ and the plan of redemption, these great themes will open to our understanding more and more. Isn't that powerful? Ellen White would write in her personal diary, on one occasion, my whole being longs after the Lord. I am not content to be satisfied with occasional flashes of light. I must have more. There's something about that connection with a loving Father that we can hardly imagine. As she was writing Desire of Ages in Australia, she would write these words in her diary again. In writing upon the life of Christ, I am deeply wrought upon. I forget to breathe as I should. I cannot endure the intensity of feeling that comes over me as I think of what Christ has suffered in our world. Have you ever felt that way about Jesus? I hope you will. I hope you have. Ellen White's writings lead us to that sense, and I've experienced it myself in reading Desire of Ages, and I hope you will, as a result of this symposium this weekend, go back and start reading some of these books if you haven't read them recently. Another one, again, a recollection in her diary or statement in her diary. I awoke at 3 o'clock a.m. I feel deeply the need of casting my helpless soul upon Jesus. He is my helper. He is my all in all. I am weak as water without the Holy Spirit of God to help me. You see, she still felt years later her helplessness and her weakness, but now she knew what to do. Isn't that right? There is a Savior there is a father, a loving father. And yes, I'm weak as water, but I have the Holy Spirit of God to help me. Oh, if we could capture this for ourselves. If we could have this as a part of our type of diary experience with Jesus. And we come to the end of her experience. And last interview she has with Clarence Chrysler, just some months before she passed away. And he asked her all kinds of interesting questions. And as they were talking and she was telling him about her life experience, she began to cry. And she said these words that were taken down because the interview was transcribed while they were together. She's come full circle her whole life. She starts out at the beginning questioning the love of God, questioning whether Jesus could forgive her sins, not understanding human nature, not understanding the plan of salvation. And Jesus brought her to himself, connected her to the Father. And Levi Stockman helped her to understand the love of God as our Heavenly Father. And she taught it through her whole life. And then she says, I find tears running down my cheeks when I think of what the Lord is to his what? What is it? Oh, it's weak. Come on. Let me read it again, and let me see if you can do better when we get to that, okay? She said, I find tears running down my cheeks when I think of what the Lord is to his children. children. That's what we are, you see. And when I contemplate his goodness, his mercy, and what? His tender compassion. Young Ellen and the love of God. Know it. Believe it. Experience it.
thank you, Dr. Burke, for your presentation. The beauty of a weekend like this is that it's not monologue, it's dialogue. And over the course of the weekend and in a few minutes tonight after the presentations, there'll be a question time, a question and answer time. And if you have a question about anything that relating to what you hear this weekend, I want to invite you to use your WhatsApp your WhatsApp, and, you can, t and you, if you can use this number, which I believe is going to come on the screen in any second. It's WhatsApp plus 44-7438-892. I have a different number in front of me to what's on the screen. That's not a good start. Is that, it's up there, okay. You better go for the number that's on the screen. 44-7438-892-076. If you have a question, please send it at any time. Our next speaker tonight is Dr. Dra Dra Dragoslava Santrach, and she is currently serving as the managing editor for the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists. I would love to hold the encyclopedia in my hand and show it with you, with you, but as most of you are aware, it is actually a production that is fully online. Holding a PhD in Old Testament from the UK Greenwich School of Theology and an MA in Biblical Languages and Old Testament from Andrews University, Slava has taught Biblical Studies at the Belgrade Theological Seminary and at the University of the Southern Caribbean uh, union in Trinidad. In addition to her current editorial role and prior experience as editor for the Southeast European Conference and Biblical Research Institute, Slava also serves as an adjunct professor of religion at Washington Adventist University. In recent times, her sphere of influence has gone global, as you may have experienced as you studied the Sabbath School lesson study uh, a few months ago on the Psalms. Let's come to human interest. Slava says that as a child, I picked blackberries and wild strawberries on my way to school, milked cows, drank water from a stream, and spent entire days building fortresses with my friends in the forest because they sound like Heidi's adventures from Spiri's famous novel. Why mention this? Because Slava believes those days significantly shaped her faith and brought her close to God. And of course, she loves telling her own children of her childhood adventures. Her presentation this evening is New Testament and the Gift of Prophecy. Welcome, Slava. We look forward to what you have to share with us. Pastor, thank you very much for this uh, very nice uh, uh, research that you did and very kind introduction. Is my mic maybe too close? Okay. Now, I think it's... No. Okay, let me see. Maybe I don't even need a mic. Just ask my children when I start shouting throughout the house. Come here. Okay. I believe it's better now. Yes. Well, as... Uh, Sabbath's holy hours are descending slowly upon us. I would like to wish you Shabbat Shalom and God's peace and blessing. Dr. Bert, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation on young Ellen and her faith. And I believe we all enjoyed. But may I play the doubting Thomas right now and ask... Uh, is there a biblical foundation for believing in post-biblical prophetic gift and for the gift of spirit of prophecy as fulfilled in Ellen White? Is there a, a, a biblical proof for all of that? And while I am the doubting Thomas this evening, I hope that I will become the believing Thomas once I, I see what the New Testament has to say about the prophetic gift or the gift of prophecy in the New Testament. 
Uh, I apologize, I missed the deadline for submitting my PowerPoint presentation, so please bear with me as I try to read my paper and keep uh, uh, to the time that was allotted for this presentation. So I shall begin. In the New Testament, prophecy is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that God bestows upon his church. We read in 1 Corinthians 12, Corinthians 12, 14, Ephesians 4, Romans 12. It is a gift with singular importance because it is one of the primary characteristics of the Holy Spirit's work in the last days, as we read in Acts 2 and an identifying mark of God's remnant people, as we read in Revelation chapter 19. Since the gift of prophecy is an essential and too broad a topic to be addressed in just one paper, this paper will focus on what the New Testament teaches about the continuity and purpose of the gift of prophecy. These aspects seem to be particularly relevant for the understanding of Ellen G. White's prophetic gift because some Christians are suspicious of prophecy in post-biblical times. Namely, the idea that God might still be providing his people with revelation of any kind is believed to imply that what we already have in the, con in the canonical and inspired form in the Bible is not sufficient. So that's where the doubting Thomas finds his idea. Why do we need more revelation once the biblical canon has been closed? If God has supplied us in Scripture with everything necessary for life and godliness, as 1 Peter 1, 11 to 12 say, what need would there be for him to reveal anything beyond what we already possess? My approach will be to delineate several related matters. And uh, this presentation will be first part is, uh, this evening, and we will continue and hopefully uh, uh, round up it tomorrow. Uh, so, the three matters. First, the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament prophecy. Second, the purpose of the gift of prophecy in the New Testament. And third, the significance of the phrase, the spirit of prophecy, in Revelation 19.10. Now, the place to begin is where the New Testament does, and that's on the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost in Acts 2 had prophetic significance. It represented the fulfillment of Jesus' promise to send the Holy Spirit to be with his followers forever. It also represented the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. And now citing the words of Joel, Peter proclaimed, And it shall pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. Since the gift of prophecy... I'm wondering and asking myself, since the gift of prophecy was already present in the Old Testament as well in the New Testament, the question is, what is so particular about the gift of prophecy in Acts 2 and onward? The Jewish audience understood the significance of Peter's proclamation very well. Let us dig a little bit into the history and get a background to what happened in Acts chapter 2. During the intertestamental period, a transformation of prophecy, 
took place that resulted in the end of the forms of communication found in the Hebrew Bible. While prophecy did not cease entirely during that time, it was transformed to such an extent that post Old Testament prophetic messages were deemed unfit for inclusion into the sacred scripture, into the sacred history. And one of the rabbinic explanations we find in Megillah chapter 14, uh, A verse 11, and here is how the rabbis explain that. They said that although, and I quote, Many prophets arose for the Jewish people. However, only a portion of the prophecies were recorded because only the prophecies that were needed for future generations were written down in the Bible for posterity. But that which was not needed, as it was not pertinent to later generations, it was not written. Therefore, the 55 prophets recorded in the Bible, although not the only prophets of the Jewish people, were the only ones recorded due to their eternal messages, end of quote. And we can read some other sources, uh, uh, for example, in 1 Maccabees chapter 9, 27, uh, uh, the, the author laments and says, so there was great distress in Israel, the worst since the time when prophets, prophets ceased to appear among them. So during the intertestamental period, and we have other sources like uh, Wisdom of Solomon, which is the first century before Christ, Philo, uh, Josephus, and other affirm the ongoing work of prophecy but at the same time, the closure of the Old Testament or Hebrew scripture. Uh, um, we have, as I said, other sources, again, like Ben Sira, the, the second century before Christ, uh, support, supports this thought. And the Jews during the intertestamental period did believe that God still communicated with his people, but on a much lower level. And they would, uh, uh, there was a, a stream uh, um, of uh, rabbinic, of, of, uh, uh, rabbinic uh, uh, tradition that believed in the so-called bat kol, which literally means the daughter of the voice meaning that God was giving this prophetic wisdom to his leaders, to the sages and uh, biblical scholars. The Qumran community viewed itself as the heir of Israel's past prophetic tradition, etc. And, but the overall consensus was, is that the prophecy, the biblical prophecy ceased. Now, even though the last prophet for the Jewish uh, nation at that time was Ezra, the Jews in the second temple period anticipated a grand renewal of prophecy when? In the messianic age. And Joel 2.28 played a key role in the conception of that view. Therefore, rabbinic tradition interpreted Joel chapter 2, eschatologically as a sign of the Messianic age, just as the Apostle Paul did. The difference was that Peter saw its actual fulfillment in his own days. Now, to answer our earlier question, what is particular about the gift of prophecy in Acts 2 is that it marked the beginning of a new era, the messianic age. And for Peter, Jesus of Nazareth was that long-awaited Messiah of whom the biblical prophets spoke. In other words, one of the differences between prophecy in the Old Testament and prophecy in the New Testament is that with the coming of the Messiah, also a new eon arrived. The kingdom of God, as Jesus said, was now in the humanity's midst. Eventually, this uh, brought 
about significant changes to the society, the people, and the Jewish cult or worship. John Peckham writes, and I quote, at Pentecost and beyond, the Spirit was sent by the Father and Son on a special mission in the plan of redemption, the role of another Parakletos. Because of what Jesus accomplished, defeating the devil via the cross, rising from the dead and ascending to minister as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, the Holy Spirit came upon the followers of Christ with new power, as if the Spirit was in some sense unleashed via the victory in Jesus. In this regard, Previously, as John chapter 7 says, the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. End of quote. Jesus is not just the climax of Old Testament prophecy. Jesus is greater than any prophet, being the prophet whom Moses announced in Deuteronomy 18. And Jesus was certainly more than a prophet, being the source of all prophecy. And in keeping with Jesus' victory over evil and sin and the start of the messianic age, now New Testament prophet would focus even more on Jesus, his life, his words, and his acts than the Old Testament prophet ever focused on the Messiah. The fullness of God's revelation came in Jesus Christ. And in accordance to that, the Holy Spirit, hence the gift of prophecy, was fully, fully given to God's people. Now, this brings us to our next point, which is uh, uh, the relationship between the Old Testament and New Testament prophecy in a little bit more detail. New Testament prophets and prophecy stood in direct line with their Old Testament counterparts who proclaimed God's message and will to the people. And in this sense, New Testament prophecy is fundamentally a development and continui continuation of Old Testament prophecy. And yet, and this is what I want to emphasize now, there are a few elements of discontinuity that, however, do not threaten that continuity. The coming of the Messiah rendered obsolete the temple service and priestly ministration. The Old Testament priesthood found its fulfillment where? In Christ, in Jesus as our heavenly high priest. The community of believers was now what? The new priesthood. These changes also affected the prophetic ministry in the New Testament times. And one of the key changes is what uh, Eckhart Miller says, a democratization of the spirit. I love how Dr. Miller put that, a democratization of the Holy Spirit that took place on Pentecost when God poured out the spirit on all flesh and not just on select individuals, namely kings, prophets, and priests, as it was in the Old Testament. Sam Storms puts it nicely, and I quote, The coming of the Spirit in power on Pentecost most assuredly did inaugurate the new covenant age in which we now live. But what the Spirit did on that day centuries ago is also designed by God to characterize the experience of God's people throughout the course of this age until Jesus comes. In other words, what we are reading in Acts chapter 2 is a description of what the Holy Spirit does in, 
through and on behalf of God's people throughout the entire course of this present age. Prophecy, says Storms, whatever it may mean, is designed by God to be a normative experience of all God's people in this age in which we live as we await the return of the Lord. End of quote. Storm said here a couple of things that we must reflect on so they don't go, uh, 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 they are not understood in a wrong way. In a wider meaning of the word prophecy, all God's children are given the Holy Spirit and Apostle Paul wishes that all would prophesy. Have you read 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 5, where Paul says, I wish that you all would prophesy. This, however, does not necessarily mean that all God's children in Christian era will in fact become prophets in the strict sense. As Paul made it very clear that the gift of prophecy is one of the spiritual gifts and not all would prophesy, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 12. Thus, in addition to the prophecy in the strict sense of receiving divine revelation for other people, can we say that the universality of the Holy Spirit in Joel 2 and Acts 2 points also to the other spiritual gift given by the Holy Spirit? May we perhaps say that the universality of the Holy Spirit also points to the more general sense of the Holy Spirit's presence, revealing to people their sinful state and enlightening them to receive the truth in Christ? The Spirit called some to serve as apostles, elders, deacons, pastors, and teachers, in this sense, we can talk about the people of God enjoying the fullness of the Spirit's presence through each member exercising their spiritual gifts. We shall now briefly explore the purpose of this gift in God's church. The New Testament uses the word family prophet to depict and to depict prophecy and may occasionally refer to prophecy indirectly. The range of phenomena covered by this word group in the first century Greco-Roman world is huge. Prophet would mean not only one who speaks for a God and interprets his will to human beings, but it was also used to describe the cultic keepers of the oracles for members of the highest order of priesthood, also for herbalists and quack doctors, for poets even, and then metaphorically, in general, for the announcers at the games. So any person announcing and sharing a knowledge that others didn't have uh, could earn this name, the prophet. Now prophecy in he the Hellenistic world was a familiar part of the culture and that's the background, that's the culture where Christianity started. Many, God, not, not just the Jewish, the Old Testament, as we, as we will hear from Dr. Milanov in his presentation, but also we have this Hellenistic Greco-Roman uh, uh, culture. Many gods were believed to have spoken through their prophets, of whom Apollo was one of the most active deities. There were many shrines. Uh, where people could consult Apollo by means of the oracle, of which Delphi was one of the most famous. And there Plutarch describes Pythia uh, at Delphi uh, as inhaling vapor coming from the fissures, uh, fissures of, the, of the earth and inhaling this vapor, falling into a trance and then uttering some unintelligible oracles or prophecies. And there, there were uh, uh, people who were called prophets who would then interpret her visions and oracles and explain them to other people. 
And it is interesting that uh, Josephus gives reports of prophetic activity in the first century that uh, in the synagogues that resembles this disorderly kind of confusing uh, uh, sharing of, of prophetical visions and messages. Now, it is possible in the light of this background that some Christian believers in Corinth were under the influence of these and similar pagan influences. If we read in 1 Corinthians 14, we see that Paul reprimands the, the, the Christians, the, the, the church members' disorderly behavior at worship and encourages them, advises them to adopt a different practice in keeping with their new Christian faith. Paul criticized some manifestations of prophecy in the Corinthian church. However, because they were problematic, however, he never denied the validity of prophecy per se. So what was, uh, uh, how was the, the gift of prophecy used in the New Testament church? First, it was used for the mission work, to advance the mission work of the church. Since the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, the gift of prophecy has enabled the believers of all times to preach the gospel to the whole world. In Acts, we read that prophecy directs the course of the mission. Remember Paul saying that the Spirit forbade us to go to a certain place and directing us, or there were prophets telling them where to go, visions of, of, of the believers in Macedonia. So you see the prophetic gift was a critical gift in the New Testament church to direct the mission work of the church. The prophetic gift also warned and prepared the believers for the upcoming hardships. And it also cautioned the believers against ill-meant people. Second, the prophetic gift in the New Testament church was used to build up God's church. Paul says that prophecy edifies exhorts and comforts people. Or in other words, it's, it is building up the church and protects church against discouragement and heresy. Prophecy can be directed to an individual, not just the whole community. For example, prophecy can disclose the secrets of the hearts of the unbelieving and lead them to repentance and salvation in Christ. 1 Corinthians 14. Then prophecy can also encourage an individual and confirm God's calling of the person for a particular mission work, as in the case of Timothy, where in 1 Timothy, if you recall the text in chapter 1, Paul says, Timothy, don't forget the prophecy that was told about you. So you see, the, God would give prophetic messages to individuals to encourage them in their spiritual walk. Some New Testament examples of prophecy show that prophecy may overlap with the gifts of knowledge, preaching, teaching, and encouragement. And this only shows that prophecy in the New Testament, like in the Old Testament, had a wider, has a wider range of meaning than simply revealing the future. The overlapping of some spiritual gifts with prophecy, however, does not mean that these gifts are synonymous in the New Testament. As Ephesians chapter 4 clearly differentiates between the gift of prophecy, the gift of preaching, the gift of teaching. So the gift of prophecy is a unique, specific gift, even though it includes aspects of knowledge and encouragement, uh, uh, prayer that other gifts uh, share as well. Now, it is very interesting now to think about 
the difference between the gift of teaching and preaching and the gift of prophecy. Because Sister White, she exercised all these gifts. And uh, often we hear that some preachers, there is a whole uh, a genre of prophetic preaching in homiletics. Are these prof is this prophetic preaching the same as the prophetic gift? I think we should be very careful with what we call prophetic, all right? And I like to think that the key difference between the uh, gift of teaching and preaching and the gift of prophecy is that teaching and preaching is always based on a text of scripture, while prophecy is based on a divine revelation often spontaneously given to a believer. And this leads us to our next point that we will discuss tomorrow, and that is prophecy and revelation, along with the analysis of uh, Revelation 19.10. But perhaps I can just close with one thought. As I was uh, uh, doing a research for this paper and reading all these uh, New Testament text. I couldn't help myself but recognize here and here and over and over again the various aspects of Sister White's ministries. So, Dr. Bird, I must confess that by now, from doubting Thomas, I am a believing Thomas. And uh, I am so grateful to God for giving us clear revelation in His Word so we can recognize his prophets and not just recognize, but acknowledge them, appreciate them, and obey them. And uh, thank you for, for being uh, uh, careful and kind listeners. And I look forward for, uh, for, for us resuming this topic tomorrow and speaking about prophecy and revelation and uh, Revelation 19.10, uh, uh, the exegesis of that text. Thank you. Thank you, Slava. Dr. Ivan, Dr. Ivan Milanov is our final presenter tonight. He serves as the undergraduate program leader and lecturer in Newbold's Department of Theological Studies and has been in this role since 2015. He holds a Doctor of Philosophy in New Testament Studies from the University of Trinity St. David, which was completed through Newbold, and his specialist area is in the Book of Daniel. A source close to Ivan informs me that he is known indeed for his love of Hebrew so much that he wears T-shirts with large Hebrew inscriptions on the front. I wonder, Ivan, which inscription is your favorite? Prior to his current role, Ivan's ministry was centered in Belgrade, Serbia, serving as pastor and evangelist of the Belgrade Central Church, and in addition, he taught at the Belgrade Theological Seminary. He is known for being a straight talker with a brilliant mind. But if you want to see Ivan's pastoral heart, watch him in action, interaction with the students he teaches. And finally, he is known for having a burden for today serving pastors. That's the pastor serving in your church and mine. The burden is that the pastor is theologically educated, equipped and trained to serve not only with competence, but with excellence. The presentation Ivan will share with us this evening is the Old Testament and the gift of prophecy. Welcome, Ivan. We look forward to what you have to share with us. <laughs> uh, thank you for these kind words, uh, Pastor Neil. Uh, just a tiny uh, remark. Uh, my PhD is in the Old Testament. Uh, that's why the book of Daniel is in the Old Testament, yeah. <laughs> uh, just not to confuse the, the audience further. Uh, okay, my topic is the Old Testament and the gift of prophecy. 
and I took a freedom to give it a subtitle, The Light in the Valley of Darkness. Every academic discourse on the gift of prophecy in the Old Testament without approaching the prophets as characters and the nature of their role in the Bible and society and the content of their message is pointless. It is the starting thesis of this presentation that the gift of prophecy is more than just a concept or idea. It is rather a relational phenomenon characterized by complex matrix of divine human and interhuman relationships. Therefore, analytical responses to the questions of who the prophets were, the content of their message, and the interpretation of their ministry and message for the contemporary audience are the focus of this presentation. Introducing a definition of what is a prophet seems a bit elusive. One of the reasons is that the contemporary expectations from a prophet are too narrow. For instance, the common view is that the prophet is a person that predicts a future. Although this was included in the ministry of the Old Testament prophets, it was only a small part of what they did. Second reason is that there has been a tendency to offer in contemporary world concise definitions because of our short span of attention. And usually these definitions are made of one sentence. For example, Janet Matthews, would consider that a prophet is a person who is an intermediary between God and human beings. This definition is based on the fact that Abraham is called a prophet in Genesis 27, because Abraham's role as intercessor on behalf of King Abimelech and his household. The case for this definition is strengthened by the fact that Moses, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Daniel were also intercessors in prayer between God and God's people. However, Moses, for instance, he was not just an intercessor between God and his people, and that was only one side of his prophetic role. But he was also a prophetic leader who conveyed messages from the Lord and provided prophetic leadership to his people in applying these messages in their own lives. The prophet's message was regarded as a revelation of God's will and plans for his people. Further, the prophets in the Old Testament had a profound role in the society, usually as moral reformers and champions of social justice. Some of them, such as Deborah, they served as judges particularly during the monarchy period, which is between 11th and 6th century BC, when the people of God faced many crises, probably the largest of them were the Assyrian and Babylonian crisis, which happened between the 8th and 6th century BC, the prophets provided moral guidance, strong encouragement, and living hope for the societies in the Northern Kingdom and later in the kingdom of Judah. Pursuing the definition of prophets further includes study of etymology of the word prophets. The three nouns usually found in the Old Testament which are related to the concept of prophets, they occur in one place in 1 Chronicles 29, 29. And here we have a list of prophets that served in the court of King David. Samuel is called Roe, which means a seer, a person who sees. Nathan is called Navi, which is in Greek uh, translated as prophetess, and the English word prophet is related to that. And finally is mentioned God, and he is called Jose, which means also seer, a person who can see. The noun seer emphasized the experience of the prophets when they were revealed information by God in vision or a dream. On the other hand, 
Jose is usually associated with the prophets who were active in the royal court. However, the noun Jose is synonymously used as Navi or with Navi in 2 Samuel 24, 11, 2 Kings 17, 13, Isaiah 29, 10. Moreover, Samuel was represented in 1 Samuel as the main advisor of King Saul, meaning that the seer, Roe, also served in the royal court. So it could be concluded that the writers of the Old Testament used all these three terms with some freedom and fluidity, without limiting the terminology to certain prophetic experiences or their social roles. The term Navi is the most common out of these three. There is a consensus among the scholars that it is etymology, etymologically related to the Akkadian word Nabu, which means to call. This is not very surprising because the call for prophetic ministry has a prophet, prolific role in some of the prophetic experiences of the prophets, such as Moses, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. Not every prophet in the Old Testament mentions these call uh, experiences. However, in these three cases, we have the so-called call narratives. They have a purpose to establish the authority of the prophet in terms of authenticity and trustworthiness. In other words, God chose prophets and the prophets only responded to his call. The call narrative is usually consisted of the following elements. The first one is encounter with the divine, usually through a vision or through theophany. Also, there are introductory words of greeting, usually uttered by God. Then the prophet, when he is faced with the call to be a prophet, usually expresses objection or demural. They would say, I'm too young, Jeremiah would say, and I can't be a prophet. Moses couldn't use the same excuse because he was a bit old, so he said, I can't, I can't speak properly. Uh, Isaiah, on his part, he said, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among people with unclean lips. So the call narrative shows that God chose prophets, not vice versa. In the history of Christianity and this world, too many so-called prophets chose themselves. But the prophets only responded reluctantly to this call. Why? Because many of them were lonely throughout their lives. Jeremiah never married. He remained a single person. And that was that strange in Israel at that time. In biblical Hebrew, there is no phrase or expression for single person. There is no expression for bachelor in biblical Hebrew. They were only also subjects or object of misunderstanding, rejection, and some of them even completed their lives in martyrdom. In terms of statistics, the rabbis inform us that there were totally 48 male prophets in the Old Testament and seven female prophets, including Miriam, Moses' sister, Deborah, Hulda, Noadiah, and some rabbis would say even Esther. The Old Testament does not record that there was any difference between male and female prophets in relation to their authority. Moreover, a successful war leader such as Barak, he actually requested from Deborah to accompany him to the battlefield as a guarantee of his victory. Regarding their literary legacy, the prophets of the Old Testament could be divided into two groups, non-literary and literary prophets. Non-literary did not or do not have books named or associated with them as authors. The literary prophets left more than 15 books as their legacy. Although majority of the prophets were Israelites, 
The rabbis also include non-Israelites among the prophets, such as Balaam and Job. On the other hand, the ancient rabbis, mostly associated with the content of the Talmud, followed the contemporary, followed by the contemporary rabbis, did not count the book of Daniel as prophetic. The rationale behind this verdict is threefold. First, the word prophet is never applied to Daniel in his book. He is rather, they say, presented as a wise man. Second, the prophetic formula, the word of the Lord came to me, does not occur in the book of Daniel. Third, the ancient rabbis differentiate between the experience of a prophet and visionary, where the experience of the prophet is considered more intimate than just receiving visions. It is interesting that this kind of difference is not found in the Bible. As we could see, prophets receive their message in a variety of ways. The prophetic character of the book of Daniel will be discussed a bit later in this presentation, but at this point should be noted that the last argument about the degrees of the Holy Spirit uh, of inspired experience are not based on what could be attested in the Old or New Testament. Let us summarize the previous discussion. Prophet actually is a person, character, and that indicates the gift of prophecy that is of divine origins, that is manifested through human beings in the real life situations. It includes, number one, revelation of God's message containing his verdict on a present situation, his will, and plans for human beings. Two, Interceding, prophet is a person who intercedes for the people of God. Number three, he delivers or she delivers a message in certain form that is for the human recipients and that can lead them towards positive changes in their lives. Number four, the prophet often embodies their message. There is something called in biblical studies, in the Old Testament studies, an acted prophecy where the prophet is silent, but he acts through his life and he passes the message. Prophet Ezekiel, he laid on one side a certain number of days and then he changes the side and that was his message. One night his wife died and God told him, you're not going to mourn after her, and you're going to be silent. Why? When the people around you ask you why, you should tell them this is how God is not going to mourn after your sons back home in Jerusalem. Prophet Isaiah, very reputable man of his time, at one point he stripped to his below clothes and he put a yoke and he was walking around Jerusalem telling them that this is the message. If you don't change your lives, you're going to be slaves. And finally, the prophets shows compassion for their audience. They're never above the audience. They're never better and they love them. Moses loved his people so much that he said to God, please, exclude me from the legacy if you exclude the people that are on the ba in the basis of the mountain. Little digression. Daniel demonstrates these prophetic traits, actually. He reveals God's message. He intercedes for his people in Daniel 9. Number three, he tells Nebuchadnezzar to change his attitude and lifestyle, Daniel 4. And in 5.5, 5, he says that he shows compassion towards Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4 by telling him this dream you had, that should be for your enemies, not for you. And also, he, said he showed compassion for his people by identifying himself with them 
in Daniel 9. The message of the prophets. Summarizing the message of the prophets is even more complex task than providing a definition of what is a prophet. Again, there is a popular misconception that the message of the prophets of the Old Testament was about and only predicting the future. Although predicting the future is a very important element of prophecy, this is not the only one element of prophecy. The Old Testament prophetic message, mainly uttered as prophetic speeches in public spaces, such as royal courts, city or town gates, entrance of the temple in Jerusalem, and various gatherings of crowds, they contain two aspects related to the prediction of the future. The first is foretelling, which means predicting of the future, and the second is forth telling, which means proclamation that prepare the audience for the foretold future. Without these two elements, we don't have a prophecy. Both elements were equally important for the recipients of the prophetic message. Foretelling content of the prophecy was about the predicted future, but the foretelling content explained to the recipients why such future was about to take place and called the recipients to undertake particular actions in order to be prepared for such future. There is no revelation or prophecy about future without a preparation for that future. Recognizing the true prophet, three points. Moses says the fulfillment of the proclaimed prophecy, but that's not enough. He says at the same time, the true prophet must worship the true God. And finally, the true prophet would never ever prophesy in collision with the already revealed will of God. Deuteronomy 18.15. Regarding the topics of the Old Testament prophecies, there is a consensus among the Old Testament scholars that the topic covenant is central to the prophetic message. Carol Dempsey is more specific than some other scholars by claiming that the topics of creation and covenant are the two focal points of the prophetic message. All other topics occurring in the prophetic books are only practical implications stemming from the main two. Dempsey commences his argument by claiming that creational accounts of Genesis 1 and 2 reflects, reflect sense of relationality. They describe God as the originator of all creation who enters in a covenantal relationship with human beings. The covenant was central for the life of humans. It sustained life, preserved life, and ensured the future of life. In other words, the creational order of relationship between God and humans was regulated by the covenant. When the human beings respected the covenant, they lived and flourished. When the human beings broke the covenant, they suffered and sometimes even experienced death. The foundational elements of the covenant were loving kindness or chesed. Chesed in covenantal discussions in the Old Testament is more important than ahav, which means he loved. Chesed is the foundational element found in Exodus 34, 6 to 7, along with emeth, which means faithfulness or truth, also mishpat, which means justice, and righteousness or tzedekah. Thus, the prophets did not invent anything substantially different from the Torah, the Pentateuch, but they enforced the idea in their message that the correct relationship of humans with God and correct relationship between human beings themselves result in life characterized by loving kindness, faithfulness and truth, justice and righteousness. All these were guaranteed, guarantees for prosperous life. Breaking the covenant, on the other hand, would bring the opposite of these. Hatred instead of loving kindness. Disloyalty instead of faithfulness. Deceit instead of honesty and truth. 
injustice and lifestyle of selfishness. The final result is that the individual and the society are on the brink of dying. This sounds very contemporary. Very contemporary. Three very important points stem from the previous discussion. Number one, the harshness of the prophetic rebuke has a purpose to bring awareness to the audience that are on the path of death and that immediate action of seeking God is necessary. Number two, the rebuke is always followed by a message about transformation of the attitude and lifestyle. So they needed grace in order to have repentance. And finally, a message of restoration always follows the me message of transformation. Such theme is not new and uh, something unique for the prophetic books. We can see actually this movement in Genesis 3 to 9. And this movement is from Genesis 3, where we have a process completely opposite of the process of creation. The process of creation is from chaos to order. In Genesis 3, we have from order to chaos. And that's called by David Klein's decreation. Then God tries to mitigate the situation and he allows human beings not to die immediately. And that mitigation usually brings a chance for new creation and the restoration. That is also seen in the narrative of the flood. The mitigation was the 120 years and also chance to survive the flood by boarding the ark. In chapter 8 of Genesis, when the flood rivers and waters, when they dried, actually after that begins a new creation or renewal of the humanity. They are given new covenant and they are also told to repopulate the, lake, the, the, the earth. So the movement in the Pentateuch is usually creation, decreation, mitigation, restoration. And something similar you could find in the prophetic books. For example, Isaiah in the first 11 chapters begin with very harsh rebukal uh, speeches, prophetic oracles against the people of God. He even compares them that they are worse than an ox or a donkey. Because ox and donkey, they know their life and their duties, but human beings don't. However, later in the book, from 40 to 55, it's the book of comfort, book of mitigation, chance for transformation. And finally, in the third part of the book, 56 to 66, is the restoration. So the theme, decreation, breaking the covenant and receiving harsh rebuke that follows, is the first part. Then there is a mitigation. God is ready to forgive. God is ready to transform. And finally is the recreation or restoration. The restoration always serves as a beacon of hope for the people of God. Finally, the interpretation. The best example of how to interpret the Old Testament prophecies are the New Testament writers. I'll give you just an example. Sometimes to certain people, it seems that the New Testament writers did not entirely follow the immediate context of the prophecies. Uh, some scholars think that the New Testament writers actually entirely or partially ignored the immediate context of the Old Testament prophecies. But that's not true, because we can recognize four principles in the New Testament how the prophecies are uh, interpreted. The first principle is corporate solidarity, which is based on the premise that there is a reciprocal relation between individual and community. So the individual represents community, and community sometimes represents an individual. For example, Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen, 
as a corporate phenomenon, people of God is applied to Christ in Luke 2 to 32. The second principle is correspondence in history or typology, which presupposes that the way how God has worked in the past was mirrored in the way how he worked in the New Testament writers' present times and also their future. For example, Matthew 2.15 quotes Hosea that out of Egypt I called my son. In Hosea is about how God delivered his uh, people Israel. But in the New Testament was fulfilled by Christ who was returning from exile in Egypt as a toddler. That's what happened to Israel as a community in the past. Hosea's statement was firstly directed to Israel mirrored what would happen to the Messiah, where God's purpose for Israel as a community were taken up as a description of Christ's ministry. The third principle is uh, eschatological fulfillment. The early church expected that they lived in the period of eschatological fulfillment, in which Christ and the events of his life were the climax of the fulfillment of the scripture. And such belief is expressed in Romans 15, 4, and 1 Corinthians 9, 10. The fourth principle is that the Old Testament is to be interpreted Christologically. This means that the Old Testament texts regarding Israel, prophets, priests, or kings, were to be fulfilled by an eschatological deliverer as no one had done it before him, Messiah with capital M. For example, Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 19, God will raise up for you a prophet like me. That was about prophets in the Old Testament, but this promise was originally not seen as messianic, but its realization was widely expected among Christ's contemporaries, and some recognized him as the eschatological fulfillment of this promise. John 6, 14. So, the New Testament writer's application of these interpretative principles demonstrates that they did not entirely ignore the context and the authorial intention of the Old Testament was preserved. It also indicates that the New Testament writers were not entirely arbitrary in choosing certain Old Testament texts and relating them arbitrary to Christ. The New Testament writers used such an approach in order to transform the mode and thinking of their readers and listeners. The final conclusion is, this presentation is only a tiny insight into the gift of prophecy in the Old Testament. However, the divine gift to his people provides a light that leads towards fulfilling life in a harmonious relationship with God and the rest of the created world. Without the prophetic gift, the people of God would forget their past, would live a life of lies in the present, and they would have no bright future. On the other hand, God raised the vast majority of the prophets in the times of immediate danger, moral darkness, and serious confusion and disorientation. By raising prophets, God gave his people reassurance that he was still in charge of human history in general, and that he was in charge in their personal history in particular, following prophetic guidance, the people of God were and are sure that they would live and will live in the light, even when walking in the valley of darkness. Ivan, thank you. Please don't go away as we want to invite you back in just a few mo moments to join our panelists, if you'd like to come up here as well, our lecturers, I should say, and form a panel uh, to have a good conversation. We have adequate time, and I thank you for helping us have that adequate time. And uh, let's just take a break for two seconds. If you need to breathe, stretch, stand, and we'll just reconvene in a very few minutes for our um, uh, time together. Thank you. I love it.
that. I love, put us in B flat, Stan. And uh, this is a beautiful song. Good afternoon. Good evening. We do need to come back together quite quickly for our discussion. Hello. Good evening. We do need to come back together. May I have the presenters um, on stage, please? Dr. Burt. We are going to just come back together. Thank you so much. If you do have a question, the number is on the screen. The number is 07438892076. Can we come back together, please? Shh. Thank you very much. Over the next few minutes, I trust we will have good conversation together. The joy of listening to things to make you think is that you ought to respond. We've had some responses. So obviously, it's, no, it's not unnatural that the majority of questions will be directed to uh, you, Mer Mervyn. Merlin. And that sort of stuff. But we want to try and spread the, spread the load. Um, the first question says, thank you for your engaging presentation about Ellen White's love for Jesus at an early age. How does this connect with the well-known paintings by Kellogg in the 1860s, where the first painting was, uh, where the focus in the first painting was the Ten Commandments in the, in the way of life. And then James White asked him to uh, redo it, where the cross became the central 
uh, part of the painting of the great controversy theme. Did the updated version of the paintings significantly message that Ellen discovered a grace awakening? Well, maybe you're familiar with the lithographs. They weren't paintings, they were lithographs. Um, first of all, to understand that history, and I know we have many questions, so I'll be very brief. Um, Merritt Kellogg did produce the 1873 lithograph, which he titled The Way of Life from Paradise Lost to Paradise Restored, and he put the cross and the law side by side, trying to show the relationship between the law and the cross. So it wasn't anti-grace, uh, it wasn't anti-cross, it was trying to represent the Christian life uh, with Christ and the cross. Um, but uh, the real reason for the next lithograph that James White did was because something in the first lithograph was controversial. There, I wish I could show you the pictures, maybe you've seen them. Uh, uh, Merritt Kellogg put an eye in the middle of the picture and this eye made people think of secret societies and this sort of thing. So James White initially redid the chart to take the eye out. And so it was the same chart minus the eye. Um, but both James White and Ellen White, who didn't originate the lithograph to begin with, it was Merritt Kellogg, felt that it would be better to give principal focus on Jesus. And so they begin to work on a revised lithograph. James White died fairly suddenly of malaria and also personal debilitation that he had experienced from a stroke and the effects of it over the years. And so Ellen White in 1883, note this is five years before the 1888 Minneapolis Conference, so this is pre-1888, uh, came out with this beautiful lithograph that put Christ in the very center of the picture, and she retitled it, Christ, the Way of Life. Christ, the way of life. Um, I would say, no, it isn't a new spiritual awakening. A reading back of her writings going all the way back, it's very clear that she's Christ-centered. In fact, when 1888 came, people forget when Jones and Wagner were sharing, she says, this is what I have been sharing the last 40 years. So she wasn't saying it was new, but it was fresh and refreshing. So I hope that's a little help. Um, I don't know if this weekend those pictures will be shown, but it, or those lithographs will be shown, but they're very interesting if you ever get a chance to look at them. Indeed, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, moving on. The, you shared tonight that uh, Ellen ex had a great experience with God. She had a very experiential relationship with God, which often manifested itself in ways we wouldn't go near today. In fact, the question says, today we are being encouraged to be very wary of experience and very, um, yeah, wary, risk averse, if you like, risk averse of letting the Spirit move us. And yet Ellen seemed to have that very experience. Well, if Satan can't, this is quoting Ellen White, if Satan cannot push us into the fires of fanaticism, he will try to keep us in the ice of indifference. Both ends are deadly. But experience, living experience, is what the Christian life is because it is a connection with God. Isn't that right? And, and the living experience is demonstrated by how we relate to it. So I would hope that we could learn something from Ellen White on this as well. Um, she was quite demonstrative. If you want to read, um, well, never mind, I won't say that. There's a lot of things you can read. But if you want to look at her experience, um, she had very demonstrative uh, experiences and our early pioneers did as well. Uh, should we let emotion control us? No. And we need to have the Bible as our foundation. And I think I'm thankful for the New Testament and the Old Testament presentations because even the prophetic gift is verified and established through what the Bible reveals. 
So I don't know if there's mm -hmm. a thought. I'll try to respond. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, to Ivan and Slava, Slava, are we skeptical of anyone claiming to be a prophet in present times? Or is it ind an indication of our lack of faith that no prophets have arisen since Ellen White nearly 200 years later? And I want to tie a further question to that about the, particularly in the Old Testament, the prophets spoke truth to power. Is that era over? So are we skeptical of the new prophetic gifts in our midst after uh, Sister White's uh, prophetic gift? Well, well, that, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. Are we skeptical? Uh, I would like to give a twofold answer. I would like to say, yes, we should be skeptical because the Bible itself, in the New Testament, Paul says, and Apostle John as well, uh, to test the prophecy and see whether they are, they are true or not. The, the word to test already implies a, a, a dose of what skepticism so we are not to be uh, uh, naive and uh, unwise so i would say yes we should be skeptical that's one part of the answer to test but on the other hand we should not be unbelieving in a sense to deny the possibility of god speaking prophetically uh, uh, to to uh, his chosen uh, servants in, 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 in the ages to come. Uh, who are we to limit God to, to, a certain, to a certain box? Or, But it should be both ways. Skeptical to test and be grounded firmly on the biblical foundation. And this is something that Ellen White was saying about herself. Uh, test my visions, test my teachings with the Bible and see whether, whether they are true. And uh, on the other hand, to acknowledge God's sovereignty in choosing the way forward for his people. Thank you. Ivan? Uh, yes, I, I agree with, with Radoslava. Uh, so I would go for the, for the second question. Uh, the prophets uh, speaking truth to the power. Uh, yes, I think that uh, the prophetic movement should do that today as well. Uh, we should speak the truth to the power, whatever that power is. So our eschatological beliefs uh, should not stop us to make now, present, nowadays, better quality life for, for us and for the people around us. So if there is injustice, we should be loud. If there is a lack of liberty, or of, of conscious lack of liberty, or free speech, we should be there. So we should protect even people who think differently than us. They should have right to speak their minds. Because once we try to stop people speaking freely, uh, actually we make martyrs out of them. And people would think, okay, you've got something to hide if you're not transparent. So uh, yes, I think that uh, we owe people our respect for their freedom, and people owes their respect for our freedom. Speaking true to the powers, more than ever. Uh, we live in a world of uh, social injustice, financial injustice, economical injustice. We live in a world where being politician is the least trusted person being. So uh, those people, they, they lowered the trustworthiness of any public ministry and public office. Uh, and that's, that's bad. Uh, so I think that we should be very truthful and very open to that. Uh, because uh, usually when people are not transparent, they have something to hide. And uh, if you analyze every pattern of great uh, scams in business, uh, in finances, uh, in politics, there is always lack of transparency. So that's why speaking truth to the power is the healthiest way to live as a human being. I have to say also that there is a price to pay. So we know that majority of the prophets, they faced uh, opposition. Opposition from very powerful people and powerful institutions. So if we have courage 
to speak the truth to the power, we should have courage, we should have resilience also to go through the temptation of persecution and being martyred as well. So being a proper follower of God was never easy. But today we are a bit spoiled because in the Western Hemisphere we live in societies where we are protected by human rights, which is excellent. We enjoy that. But I think we are very spoiled. If something goes uh, against us, we say we have human rights. Uh, but at the same time, we forgot the, the, the skillfulness, the, the Christian characteristics of being uh, martyrs. Uh, and that's forgotten, forgotten Christian skill and characteristic and mindset as well. Thank you. I think I can add a thought yeah. to that, please. What he's saying is very good, but the prophets were unique in that they were given direct divine guidance. So it wasn't just a truth of ideas. It was God's message to power. And yes, they faced it. You know, just what comes to mind is Elijah and King Ahab. Um, God speaks to power. And that's something really significant. And God used Ellen White in that process as well in, in some instances. Let's stay on this just a little bit because of, uh, there's a direct question about Ellen White and her understanding of slavery. And we know that she often spoke out against uh, the evils of slavery. But this is a sort of theological question. Could you explain Ellen White's understanding of slavery and the salvation of slaves? From her writings, it seems as though the slave wouldn't be resurrected but they would be judged as though they never lived. Now, I don't know the veracity of that statement, but maybe you do or not. First, uh, one of the things she spoke specifically against is the fugitive slave law. And so there she was speaking against a law that was immoral from God. Um, this one statement that you're talking about is a single statement. I see Kevin Burton sitting in the audience here um, we just had uh, uh, Ellen White and Current Issues Symposium where a presenter gave a presentation on this very issue. And I'm looking forward to the uh, publication of that book. And uh, Dr. Burton has just defended his dissertation on uh, slavery, the issue of Millerites and their opposition to slavery, abolitionism. But Ellen White is very consistent about the full humanity of, whether, of, of those who were slaves and those who weren't, irrespective of their uh, color or whatever it might be. And so she's very emphatic on that. She's speaking in this particular statement of a very extreme situation where a person is put, kept at a level to where they can hardly even respond or live as a human. And this would not apply necessarily, probably, I mean, I, this would require a long discussion, this particular question, but it could apply to any person who is put in that type of a setting. And I think her emphasis here in this statement is on the mercy of God, not on his restricting of salvation. So we need to think about that carefully. But again, this is a very... A, un a special statement in a certain situation and should not be generalized. Um, she's very clear. You know, we're all relatives, isn't that right? We all come from Adam and Eve. Therefore, there is an intrinsic biblical equality. And so that's a biblical teaching. That's something that Ellen White taught as well. Thank you. And I recognize that we could write essays, do presentations on every single question that, that's given tonight. A general one for all three of you, about what impact did her Methodist background have on her theological understanding? She came from Methodism, did it stay with her, did it grow, you know, what was the, what, or, or disappear? How did that affect how she saw God? Merlin, did you start? Well, okay, I'll start. Um, she starts as a Methodist. I told you a little bit of her story of conversion. You know, you can be a Methodist and still not understand salvation. Isn't that right? But you, you have these kind of two approaches to salvation. You have Armenian and you have Calvinist. 
approaches to salvation. The Methodist is clearly an Armenian approach that gives emphasis to choice, still recognizing the sovereignty of God, which is the more Calvinist approach. So Ellen White has, you can see from the beginning, a more Armenian approach to salvation. And I would say that as Seventh-day Adventists, we are closer to that today as well. It doesn't deny the sovereignty of God and the absolute authority of God, but it recognizes that God chooses to let us choose, which is what allowed even Satan's rebellion and so forth. So, uh, yes, I think there's an effect, but it would be a, a problem in my mind in looking at it to limit her to a Methodist understanding. Her understanding grew and was very expansive as she went through her lifetime. Okay, thank you. Slava? Yes. Well, uh, um, no one lives and grows in a vacuum. So the, the same applies to the prophets. The prophets are human beings of flesh and blood. Uh, and, and of course, that they grew in certain contexts and, and developed under certain circumstances. And I believe that God takes all of that into consideration. And he, by his grace, the Holy Spirit transforms all these influences under his grace so that the prophet truly represents in fullness the will of God to the people. And when we look at, at, at the Bible, people have a hard time understanding how the Bible is the word of God. Did God dictate every single word? Some people find that to be the solution because, yes, then God is fully in control. But that's not the correct view of the Bible. The Bible is what? A divine human book, ju just like Jesus, incarnated Lord, fully divine and fully human. And I believe that this somehow correlates to the nature of the prophet and, and the prophet's work, including, including Sister White. With this, with this topic, but I would say that uh, two most precious uh, advice that I received from Ellen G. White is uh, the centrality of Jesus, God, for my life, and uh, one of her last sermons at the general conference sessions when she raised up a book and when she said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm recommending this book to you, and that was the Bible. The rest of it are just details for my colleagues in systematic theology. <laughs> Thank you. This is uh, a very straightforward question, and it may be a yes or a no, but I'm sure you'll want to uh, wrestle with it a little bit. Uh, for, and to, to Ivan and, and Slava, was John the Baptist an apocalyptic prophet or a classical prophet? Well, I, I don't read anywhere in the Bible the word apocalyptic prophet or classic prophet. So these are mostly like human attempts to define and describe the prophet. Uh, so uh, a prophet is a prophet. This is my understanding. So John the Baptist, Jesus said, was the greatest of all living men. So he had the characteristics of what we would classify as a classical prophet. But as an apocalyptic prophet, he did point to Jesus and the future. But I am always uneasy when it comes to this uh, terminology because people define the ter these terms in different ways. So for me to say yes on this or no on that, I'm not sure the person who asked what's their definition of these terms. All right, thank you. <laughs> uh, I think he was both. Yeah. He was both. Uh, he was classical prophet in terms that he announced a, an immediate future, which was Jesus Christ. And to some extent, he was apocalyptic prophet because he was calling for a final judgment that the Messiah would come to clean up uh, the place. Uh, and uh, he, was, he was very adamant about that. Uh, on other instances, he was typical classical prophet because he spoke the truth to the power. That's why he paid with, by, uh, with his head, with his life. So, uh, John the Baptist was both. Okay, thank you. We have time for one more question tonight. And I'm bringing it back to our personal relationship with God. 
and that's in there for tonight. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a question that I think we many people struggle with in Adventism. And the question is, how does Ellen White link the unfathomable love of God and at the same time our greatest need for holiness and Christ-like character? The person has put the two in tension, that God, has, God extends his love unconditionally without exception. And yet, there is a call to have holiness and Christ-like character. Well, this question sounds very Methodist question. All right. Uh, I, I, I would say that uh, holiness is predominantly the characteristics, uh, characteristic of God's own being. That cannot be extended. The holy place, the holy uh, location is where God is. So it depends on God's presence. So it's not something that we produce. It's not something that we work for. It's not something that we deserve. It's something that God offers when he comes in our lives and he lives in us, with us, and guides us. So... Holiness without God is impossible task. Uh, holiness without God is a non-biblical, I would say, pagan concept. Uh, concept is uh, concept of holiness, uh, and the idea of holiness is uh, is something that you can't take it from God. So God is holy, and wherever He is, that place, that person is holy. That's it. Slava than Merlin. Yes, well, uh, what comes to my mind uh, when, when you read this question is one uh, uh, quote from Sister White. I don't know to cite it in English. I memorized it when I was very young in my original language. But it goes something like this, that God's righteousness is not some kind of robe that covers our sins and hides our sins, but it is actually an active principle of love that transforms our character, our nature, to, to, to meet the righteousness of God and be holy like Him. So this is where I see this relationship between God's love and His justice or righteousness, is that like right and left hand, when God hugs us, there is one hand of grace and the other hand of righteousness and justice, and that embrace transforms us into who he wants us to be, our very best, the, 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 our very happiest and blessed in his, in his eyes. That's very well said, Slava. Thank you. What I thought of as I was reading this question is Ellen White's own description of the Lord's call to her. If you want to read the first part of Selected Messages, Volume 1, you'll, you'll find several statements gathered there where she's saying what her work is, what God called her to do. And one of the things, of course, certainly she is lifting up what, what I shared and what it, she shares, which is the centrality of Jesus and God's love and his redemptive power to save us. But connected to that is holiness. And one of the particular things that she was shown by God that she was to present is this restoration of the character of God in our lives through the Holy Spirit. It's not, it is not the way of salvation. It is the result and the experience of salvation. And we cannot separate the two, and they're not in competition. Some people put them in competition. There is no competition. In fact, sanctification is a work of grace. Isn't that right? As surely as the forgiveness is a work of grace, all things come from God, and he is our righteousness. And I like the way Dragoslava said it's over us, but it also comes into us, the Holy Spirit. All that remains for me is to thank each of you for your, presence to, for your presentations tonight, for expanding our mind, helping us wrestle with issues, and hopefully having greater trust in God and who he is. Thank you. Would you give a hearty amen as an expression of thanks?
Now, some of us live in countries where we see the sunset. In the United Kingdom, we often rely on what the meteorological office tells us because we don't see the sun all the time. So I'm here to announce, and you may, if you look behind you, have seen that it's dark outside. The sun has set, which means it is Sabbath. Now, some of you may have grown up in cultures, uh, church, local church cultures, where you didn't say happy Sabbath, you just said Sabbath. But I would like you to know that this weekend, we can experience a happy Sabbath. So I'm going to invite you just to turn to your neighbor and wish them in English or your native tongue a happy Sabbath. <laughs> now, having done that, If somebody wished you a happy Sabbath, but you would believe they were being a hypocrite, we really do wish you all a blessed and happy Sabbath. Now, we do have some announcements, but just to remind you, we are going to finish on time. And I think it was Dr. Merlin's presentation uh, where Ellen White, early in her life, said uh, experience that she was woken at 3 a.m., and I say this to say that we are starting early in the morning. There is a time, you may not have heard of it, particularly on a Sabbath, called 0845. That's when we'll be beginning our meeting tomorrow down in the gym. We do believe in remnant theology of a kind, and I know that the remnant will be there. So we look forward to seeing, we're finishing on time, there's plenty of time to sleep, but there's also plenty of time to fellowship. It's going to be a full day. I also need to say that we, um, and I know that uh, Pastor Neil, a number of questions have been posed. Um, the moderators are trying to ensure that we get all of the questions to our presenters. And clearly some of us have come from near and far with questions, not necessarily related to what uh, the speakers have presented or will present, but around Ellen White, her life, her ministry, etc. We will endeavor to do our best to have all of these questions answered. If we're unable to, please forgive us, but at the 100th celebration, we will answer the questions then <laughs> in 50 years' time. Thank you, God bless you, and a happy Sabbath. Thank you, Ian. Okay, just a few announcements before we end. Registration is in Salisbury Hall. If you haven't registered and got your badge, you can't have a meal. So I would suggest that you go and make sure you register this evening. And breakfast is from 7 to 8 in the cafeteria. So it's a nice early Sabbath start. Going to be excellent for you. Nice, happy Sabbath. Um, as Ian said, 8.45 in the gym tomorrow morning we start service. And for the children, it'll be 8.45 in Salisbury Hall. For the youth, it'll be 8.45 in Moor Close. Um, if you have children, for safeguarding purposes, please ensure that you know where your children are at all times. And lastly, resources for Stanbury Press. After Sabbath tomorrow evening... Um, the press will be opened, and as Dr. Merlin Burt said, if there are books from Ellen White you haven't read and want to read, they will be available then. Um, thank you very much. Thanks to all the presenters. Thanks to you for being here. Um, we're going to finish on time. Please can you stand for prayer? Kind, loving Lord and our Father in heaven, we have listened We've heard about you. We've heard about the centrality of you in Ellen White's writings. Lord, we've listened to presenters. We've heard questions, Lord. We have sang. We've welcomed the Sabbath. Lord, renew the passion in us that Ellen White had. Renew the passion in us today, Lord, in a 21st century way. 
as we go to our various places today. May we have a pleasant sleep and wake us up, Lord, at three or two or whatever, so we can be here tomorrow morning on time. In Jesus' name, amen. Played a fundamental role in defining the rationale and objectives of Seventh day Adventist education. Her views on education are connected to her core meta narrative of the great controversy between God and Satan. For her, education is a key agency in restoring humans to God's original plan. She promoted integrating biblical faith with formal learning. Thanks to her inspired vision and persistence, the Adventist Church has developed a global education system with unique characteristics. White shared her inspired counsel on education in her articles and three books, namely Christian Education, Special Testimonies on Education, Thanks to her inspired and vision Education. And Church has developed a global in 1913, her various writings addressed to Adventist members were published in the book Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students regarding Christian Education. Her book Education remains the most concise expression of her ideas and has been translated into more than 30 languages. To learn more about the history of Adventist education and schools around the world, please visit the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists at encyclopedia.adventist.org and check out over 4,000 other stories, thousands of photographs, and hundreds of videos on Adventist history. That's encyclopedia.adventist.org.